Yeah, check in Wednesday and see if uh, see if Bob might be wearing the same shirt then as he is now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to our third edition of Geezerology Gazette. Dee has rejoined us this week from St. Louis. Bob up in Kansas City. I'm here in South Florida. And we're just going to talk about riff a little bit on a couple of items that, uh, that have happened in the headlines this week. Bob, our intrepid reporter. Take it away, buddy. All right. So this is your non-roving reporter. <laughs> <laughs> in the city. And I want to start out with something that happened here in uh, my backyard uh, earlier this week. So um, according to the Kansas City Star, protesters from the uh, Topeka, Kansas-based Westboro Baptist Church were on the receiving end of a message of love and disco music from the back of a flatbed truck, which moved slowly along the street near Azura Amphitheater in Bonner Springs, Kansas. And this was ahead of last Thursday night's uh, Foo Fighters concert there. And the uh, church had come out to protest the Foo Fighters. So church members hoisting signs with messages such as free will is a satanic lie and God is your enemy were in a grassy field near the street. So as they moved closer to this truck that was coming down the street, uh, they were treated to a message of love from the Foo Fighters themselves. So the band was in the bed of this big flatbed truck and front man Dave Grohl yelled out, all right, now, ladies and gentlemen, I got something to say because you know what? I love you. I do. The way I look at it is I love everybody. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? Can't you just love everybody? Because I think it's about love. That's what I think. We're all about love and you shouldn't be hating. You know what you should be doing? You should be dancing. And then the Foo Fighters broke into a cover of the 1976 Bee Gees disco hit, You Should Be Dancing. And the <laughs> video of this has gone viral. You can find it on Twitter and all over the place. Now, that's not the first encounter between the Foo Fighters and Westboro Baptist Church. And uh, back in 2015, the Foo Fighters did a show at the T-Mobile Center in downtown KC. And of course, Westboro was there to protest that. So the band showed up in a pickup truck and danced to a Rick Astley song on the street in front of the uh, church. So, and um, I have this is, had, this is this is all this is all about uh, this is all about the uh, uh, the Foo Fighters' insistence on uh, on vaccination proof. No, no, no. Uh, um, the Westboro Baptist Church has been around for quite a while. And their big thing is they're stridently anti-gay. And oh, uh, so, they, okay. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger issue than that. Okay. Oh yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, they firmly believe that God is wreaking punishment on the U S because, you know, we've all fallen into sin and everything. And um, they, uh, one of their things that they're known for is picketing and protesting at the funerals of American servicemen and women you know, yes. especially the ones that died. and um, that, that burned me up. Yes, it does. And so they will show up at the funeral services for, you know, the service members and, they're, and, they, and they picket and protest there. And they're saying that um, these service people were killed because of God's wrath on the U.S. for uh, allowing the LB, LGBTQ a thing to flourish yeah so this is essentially just the foo fighters just turning it turning it around turning it on around them. yeah, yeah. Okay. and we uh my family and i went out to a vacation in colorado quite a few years ago and we stopped in topeka to eat lunch at the wendy's and we had to drive through one of their protests and they've been in lee summit protesting stuff and um yeah they uh they've had a long history of doing this stuff you know <laughs> yeah i, I mean they have all this time to go out and protest uh, funerals of veterans and stuff like that. <laughs> they just, they're, they're, they're so fringe. I think they must just seek to bring the attention to themselves. And if they get berated or attacked, then I think they file lawsuits against people. 
I've read that as a background. So, yeah, yeah I, and uh, it's not, and they don't confine themselves to just being right around here in KC. They travel all over the U.S. going to these funerals. Yeah, you know, and I don't think they've been yeah. to. Um, you know, I, I think the the fatality rate from Iraq and Afghanistan, I guess, has dropped off. So I don't think they've done anything like that recently. But yeah, they they got a lot of notoriety. And then I think the, um, in reaction to that was the formation of the group, the Freedom Riders. Exactly. Yes. Exactly, Bob. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there's this uh, motorcycle group that formed. Is it Freedom Riders or Patriot Riders? No, it's the uh, Patriot Riders. Yeah, yeah. And so they would they would uh, show up with hundreds of motorcyclists, and they would wind up trying to shield the the mourners at the funeral service from the Westboro church people. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I've heard of Westboro Baptist Church. I, I know that they're that they're evil people like that. Yes, but they I, are. But they're, I never, I never paid close and gave it enough of my attention to really know the details of what they were all about. Okay. They are, they are well, good. Well, good. Turn around on them. Good. Turn it good for Dave Grohl and the food fighters. Good. Yeah. So Excellent. anyway, the, um, the video is pretty cool. If you guys want to go look it up on the internet. Okay. Uh, moving on for the first time since 1963 drummer, Charlie Watts is recovering from an unspecified surgical procedure. Uh, won't be behind the drum kit for the Rolling Stones. Um, you know, and the Stones are currently on a stadium tour. So filling in for Watts uh, is a man named Steve Jordan. And he has a connection with the band that dates back decades. Uh, he worked with, including <clears throat> the Rolling Stones guitarist, Keith Richards, expensive winos projects. And he even uh, <clears throat> drummed on one of the Stones albums, <clears throat> Dirty Work, excuse me. So um, if you follow album credits, Jordan, who's 64 years old, uh, should be familiar to you. Um, he's, he's drummed on all of Keith Richards' uh, solo work. He's also drummed for John Mayer, Stevie Nicks, Bruce Springsteen, uh, the Blues Brothers, you know, the Belushi Ackroyd Project, <clears throat> and many others. And also, uh, if you watch TV, you may recall that Jordan was the drummer for the house band of Saturday Night Live from 77 to 78. And he was also late night with David Letterman from 82 to 86. Uh, before that, he played in Stevie Wonder's band, Wonder Love, and did a whole slew of R&B, jazz, and fusion albums. Now, here's where I'm gonna tie it into us. Uh, earlier on our Geezerology YouTube show, we profiled uh, Neil Young's Freedom album, and we talked about Neil Young's legendary performance of Rockin' in the Free World on Saturday Night Live back in 89. And Rolling Stone Magazine described that as one of the most electrifying live performances on that show, if not all of live music on TV. And the person there behind Young slamming away on his drum kit was Jordan. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we took a look at that video just a couple of three weeks ago. Yep. Exactly. So I, that's why I wanted to include it. Okay. So he knows, he knows how to, uh, how to support a, 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 a kicking ass rocking band. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and also we, we mentioned last week about, you know, uh, the Rolling Stones with their new stadium tour. And I commented on the combined ages of the band and how they're still going strong, you know, even being senior citizens. But I guess Charlie kind of broke that, um, uh, line. So he's sitting out this tour recovering from his surgery. Feel better, Charlie. Uh, Absolutely. So, so are, are Mick and Keith the only uh, the only Stones on this tour? Then, oh, Ron Lyman Wood is gone. Ronnie Wood. Yeah, Ron Wood, because you know Ron wasn't oh. there. To, yeah, so yeah, Mick and Keith yeah. would be the only true. Right, right, yeah, right, 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 right. Ron Wood's really a Stone. But He's been Ron Wood's been around for a okay. long time. Okay, yeah. okay. But, so they're so they're they're a trio now and not a quartet. Exactly, a five no. piece. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So, and I'm going to have something on Ron Wood uh, to go over next week. And I okay. would have thrown it in this week, but just too much stuff going on. So Okay. All right. Uh, last but certainly not least. Okay. Um, so when the lead singer of The Doors, Jim Morrison, died 50 years ago in 1971 at the tender age of 27, 
He left behind boxes filled with poetry, journals, and handwritten lyrics of what would become some of the rock era's most memorable songs. Not only my opinion, but the opinion of many other people. So the so-called Jim Morrison archive, which includes Morrison's passport, family photos, and a drawing he made of his younger sister when he was about 18, is held in a highly secure climate-controlled vault in Los Angeles. And uh, Morrison's sister, Ann Morrison Tuning, uh, compiled material from this archive into a new book that was released earlier this year titled The Collected Works of Jim Morrison. So anyway, in a nod to the enduring cultural legacy of the music of the doors, CBS's, CBS News' Sunday morning program today aired a segment in which correspondent John Blackstone talked with tuning and with the two surviving members of the doors, drummer John Dinsmore and guitarist Robbie Krieger, about Morrison's impact as a writer and a performer. And if you missed the airing of that uh, this morning, you can view uh, the piece at uh, www.cbsnews.com forward slash Sunday hyphen morning. Uh, so you can go on there and watch the full six minute and some odd uh, package that was put together. Um, I think it um, says a lot about the cultural impact of Jim Morrison and the doors here 50 years after he's died, 50 years after the release of their last album. You know, we're still fascinated with. He's Morrison. been gone 50 years, but he never went away. <laughs> it's yeah. like he just keeps coming back. It's like, you well, know, yeah. zombie I remember rock back, star, man. Yeah. I remember back. <laughs> I can't remember exactly when it was. It's been at least a couple of decades or more. Rolling Stone put Morrison on the cover, along with um, a tie, along with a teaser that said, um, <clears throat> "He's uh, sexy." No, it wasn't. Uh, he's hot. He's sexy, and he's dead. Yes, exactly. He's hot. He's sexy. <laughs> and he's dead. You know, so, and yeah, you know, and they were. The, the, you know, this was I don't know 20, 30 years ago. You know, at least a couple of decades after he died. And, you know, they were profiling how <clears throat> still intent people were in, in his music. And now here we are half a century later, you know, and um, we've got a new book out and, you know, CBS News thought it was important enough to profile. Yep. 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 And Krieger and Densmore have been, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're still making appearances and talking about this guy. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I did see that piece this morning. Uh, thanks for sending the note about it, Scott. And uh, I thought it was pretty well done for somebody who maybe never heard of the Doors or Jim Morrison, although I find that hard to believe even today. <clears throat> and uh, it kind of goes to show me how he really, uh, yeah, he wanted to be known as a poet and a writer, but it also showed me how much his family, particularly his sister, has, they've, you know, really protected and curated his legacy, you know, that he was not just some silly guy that, uh, you know, party too much and all that. And, uh, and I, I think it goes back to that, <clears throat> you know, Krieger said, Oh, I wrote light my fire. This might be <laughs> true, but Morrison had the lines that tied it all together, yes, he did. you know, uh, make our love a funeral pyre and uh, try to set the night on fire. I mean, that just adds a whole, different uh well it you know, brought it brought it brought that song into the doors universe so it was unmistakably doors exactly you know? yeah, yeah, it was yeah a that, just a little piece that morrison added to krieger's work yeah yes. yeah made it made it a doors piece and not a robbie krieger piece right yeah yeah and, and that uh, wasn't the only krieger song that, that morrison did that to yeah. you know so yeah so it um you know the 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 individual members of the doors each one of them was an incredibly talented musician. Um, and there's no denying that there was the unique stuff that each one of them brought and made that band. And as much as, I mean, I love Ray Manzarek. He was a great keyboardist. Krieger, I think, is an underappreciated guitarist. Uh, and, you know, brought, and you know, Ginsmore was, you know, was a great drummer. So they were all very talented people, but you cannot deny the impact that Morrison had. That was that was the charisma. That was yeah, the that's where the charisma was. Yep. Yes. And yes. I, I think something about Manzarek too. I mean, this 
is that he saw there was something in Morrison uh, that day. I mean, he knew him as a classmate at UCLA. And when he, uh, you know, sat down and read the words to Moonlight Drive, he says, that's it. You know, immediately he, he knew there was something. Yeah, something to work guy. with there, right? Yeah. And yeah, and then Manzarek, I would have to say, is certainly uh, he carried the, uh, <clears throat> the baton for keeping the doors out there all those years. You know, Manzarek is one of the most articulate rock musicians out there, and he was very, very much yeah. putting them out there. And, you know, I, I, yeah, I he's, yeah, he spent he's, he's, he's spent his entire life uh, uh, upholding that legacy. And yeah. that's why he got he 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 was he was really he was really really upset, very angry with the uh, Oliver Stone movie. Yeah, saying, saying that you know because that that was not that was not. Uh, that was not the guy that Manzarek knew, you know, and he, he, he felt that he felt that Oliver Stone turned him into just a cartoon drug, drug addled cartoon idiot. You know? Yeah, it, it, exactly. Yeah. And uh, well, there's a, there was a book that I read earlier this year and it was written by a gentleman who um, hung with Jim Morrison uh, in the couple, t- but the, the couple years before the doors broke, and he was uh, good friends with Morrison and uh, at the time Morrison's girlfriend. And he wrote a book about you know, hanging out with the two of them. And yeah, he paints a totally different picture of Jim Morrison. You know, yeah. He paints a picture of a shy, um, you know, young man who was totally in love with this girl. And when they broke up, you know, it, it affected him. And that's where a lot of his songs came from you know, was um, his feelings for this girl and everything. So, um, you know, it wasn't the drug crazed person that we came to, you know, think about. Uh, And um, Morrison certainly had his demons, you know, that propelled him. But also at the same time, many, many, many people talk about, you know, that he was actually basically a very shy, you know, nice guy. But who just yeah, yeah. Well, he, yeah. Demons. So. He had a he had a substance abuse issue. Yes, no and that's that's where and that's that's where a lot of those stories come from. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I, I think part of it too is his way of dealing with the fame, you know, mm-hmm. and all the attention. In in my view, I I think it got to be so much that you know he had to self medicate himself to I think take the edge off all the expectations and. Uh, yeah, we're, as a matter of fact, uh, Bob and I started out uh, this YouTube channel. Uh, actually, our first couple, we, we, we started out doing uh, discussions of the, the Doors albums. And uh, we're going to pick up, continue with that discography here sometime in the next few weeks when, uh, when we're going to uh, uh, do a video discussing Morrison Hotel. So look for that coming up sometime in the next three or four weeks. And we'll have more doors for you. That's uh, that's the one thing that all three all three of us have in common is the, the, the three of us were all huge <laughs> Doors fans back in the day. Uh, back when back when the Doors were actually contemporary and Jim Morrison was still alive. That was uh, I remember that was that was one of the tragic events of my uh, of my youth. Was uh, yeah. I walked. I uh, D and I lived in the same neighborhood. And uh, I remember walking to Dee's house during the summer. It was, it was, it was right around July 4th. And uh, during the summer, I remember walking to uh, Dee's house and knocking on his door to see if Dan was home. And his brother answered the door and he told me, hey, did you hear that Morrison guy died? And that's, uh, that's how I found, that's how I got that news. Is, is your, your, your brother Pat told me that when he answered the door when I knocked on your door. Yeah, I said, oh, you're boy. full of shit. <laughs> I, told him, I don't know. Okay, cause, cause, cause Pat, Pat was a bit of a, Pat was a bit of a firecracker and a prankster. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> a kid, and I thought he was pulling my yes. leg. Yeah. He's going, no, no, he did. Yeah. I remember that. I remember that just coming on the heels of Janis Joplin and uh, Jimi Hendrix dying. Yeah. Versus was, the J. Uh, yeah. The 27 yeah, year old man- J's, right? <laughs> What made it uh, more so was that LA Woman had only been out for a couple months and right. it did very well. Right. You know, right. You know, people were talking. Yeah, it, was being, it was being heralded as a comeback for them. Right. Yeah, they said they, they're going in a new direction. And uh-huh. I, I always thought that they pointed to maybe Riders on the Storm. 
which, uh, you know, I thought it really showcased Morrison's voice. Excellent. But there was a lot of old fashioned blues. Yeah, he album. just he's got he got a he he got a blues old man blues voice on in that album. And, yeah. But yeah, but yeah, we'll get we'll get we'll get to that one after Morrison Hotel. Next up, Morrison Hotel, and then probably sometime sometime later in the year we'll get to L.A. Woman. Uh, okay, Bob, is that uh, does that wrap up your? That wraps report? up my report for this week. D, you have anything for us? Uh, well, I kind of teased it before about Joe Jackson going on tour next year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sing you sing singers tour and he's going to start out in uh, Europe, uh, in Ireland, uh, March uh, 13th. They're going to play Limerick, Ireland, and they'll conclude their European tour in Lisbon, Portugal, April the 30th. North American tour dates will be announced uh, this later this fall. So Joe Jackson, and he's uh, touring with the same band that he did a couple of years ago on the uh, four decade tour. So. Is uh, Graham maybe in that band? Bass player? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Graham maybe has been him, been with him from the beginning, I think. Yeah. I saw Joe Jackson. Golly, it was like 1990. I saw him in a little, little club in Washington, DC. Great show. He put on, he put on a great show. I saw him in 1982 at the University of New Mexico, uh, Pope Joy Hall, and uh, you know he was had some top 20 uh, uh -huh. success. It was it was very good. It was only seated like 800 people, so it was a great uh -huh. venue and show. And and then 22 years later, I see him at the uh, American Theater in downtown St. Louis, and uh, he was touring with Todd Rundgren. They both did individual sets came out and then they did a uh, <clears throat> song together. They did a Beatles song while my guitar gently weeps, which was kind of an interesting uh, <laughs> twist. So anyway. Yeah. I was a huge Joe Jackson fan back in the day. I, I, I had most of his albums up to a certain point. I really liked yeah. him a lot. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll, maybe we'll do one of his albums at a geezerology discussion here fairly soon since since now i i just i just did learn that uh i just did learn that d, d was a big joe jackson fan i didn't know that so so we'll talk we'll tackle one of his albums fairly soon we'll we'll get we'll get we'll get bob uh we'll we'll make bob a, a joe jackson fan <laughs> uh, garth brooks was in kansas city last night did a sold out show at uh, arrowhead stadium with at least 54,000 people there and uh, Kansas City put a mask mandate back into effect uh, Monday of this week. Uh, and then uh, starting Monday of next week, uh, Jackson County has a mask mandate. So uh, that affects, you know, where I live. So uh, we're, we're facing mask mandates here again. And there was a lot of consternation about uh, Brooks's show, you know, and uh, so you can't, uh, if you were, sitting in you know the bleachers at arrowhead you didn't have to have a mask on but any enclosed spaces at arrowhead they wanted you to put a mask back on and then the state of kansas is saying if you were unvaccinated and went to the garth brooks show when you come home to kansas they want you to go into quarantine oh wow yeah you know, how how they're going to enforce that who knows so it's going to be a voluntary thing um and then brooks is talking about the remainder of his shows are up in the air you know whether they're going to finish that stadium tour or not. So, really, uh, yeah, and uh, no decision has been made, and it may be a thing of um, playing it kind of by ear as they go along. But he has publicly talked about whether that that tour will continue or not. You know, uh, oh wow! Because so so Bob, when Garth Brooks announced the tour, of course conditions were different. Things were opening up. Things were relaxing. And then, you know, unforeseen circumstances. And uh, and I guess, is Garth thinking, is it more about his, the band? Or, or, or does he think it would be an undue hardship on his fans? And he's talking about the fans, you know. And because um, like I say, it's, it's strictly a stadium tour. So, um, you know, I know that he did 
Uh, so you're talking about shows where you could potentially have 80, 90,000 people in them. And I think every one of them is going to be sold out because, you know, yeah, yeah. popularity. So uh, even out and, and like I say, you know, they're, they're outdoor shows because they're all in stadiums, but still, you know, that each, every one of those could be a super spreader event. And I was just reading this morning where they've already had a couple outdoor um, things uh, involving music where they've picked up you know, quite a few COVID infections. So who knows where this is going to wind up again. Yeah. 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 52 years ago, photographer Ian McMillan took a stepladder out to the street, climbed up on the third step of the stepladder, oh, and the police be. stopped traffic for about uh, 15 minutes. John, Ringo, Paul, and George went walking across the crosswalk, and <laughs> photographer Ian McMillan shot uh, five or six photos and picked the best one and put it on the cover of Abbey Road. <laughs> that photo was that photo happened fifty-two years ago today. Uh, such an iconic, such an iconic photo. It's incredible how I mean, every, everybody knows what that photo is. Right? What, what, what kills me, though, is I think a couple other Beatles album covers were a little bit more, you know, like Revolver and, uh-huh. and of course, Sgt. Pepper's. But this album, you know, it was just there they are. They're walking in the crosswalk. And then before you know it, people come up with all these other side stories because Paul, oh, he's walking barefoot. That means he's dead or something. Right. There's a license plate. There's a license plate there on one of the cars that said 28IF. And people interpreted that to mean that it, Paul would be 28 if he were still alive. That was all, all part of that whole craziness. Oh my God. Oh, that was that was crazy. I remember that, man. That was that was some craziness there. You know, a, a couple of weeks ago we talked about that uh, music photography documentary series on PBS. Right. And uh, one of one of their segments, they actually got into the story of, of that photograph being taken. Yeah, see that's, that's I have this uh, I have this thing on my wall. It, uh, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. It was a couple of three couple of three years ago, this was uh, this was a shot, just a picture of that of the street there. Uh, Twenty nine years ago, in Montreal, a riot broke out. When Metallica, the opening act for Guns N' Roses in Montreal, Metallica's show was cut short when singer James Hetfield was injured by pyrotechnics. A firework or something got away from him and, uh, and, and it burned James Hetfield. So he got hurt. So, so they cut the show short. Guns N' Roses came on, took the stage. And in the middle of their second song, Axel Rose says, oh, I have a sore throat. Okay, we're done. And they <laughs> left the stage. <laughs> this is in Montreal. This, is, this isn't in St. This isn't in Detroit. This is in Montreal, Canada. <laughs> Cancellation of the show led to a riot by the audience who overturned cars, smashed windows, looted local stores, and set fires. You know, I mean, uh, you got to say, you know, of course they're angry. They're, they paid money to hear their favorite group perform, <laughs> although that does seem like an overreaction. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I get it. I get it. The, you know, Hetfield gets gets hurt by a wayward firecracker or something. It's like, OK, yeah, that, that's there. But Axel Rose, oh, my throat hurts. You know, well, so much. For Axel you. Rose, he, he, he built up a reputation for pulling crap like that yeah. and not showing up. And, you know, but, uh, also me. some. So much for the image of those mild-mannered Canadians. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. Montreal. Uh, four years ago, 2017, American singer, guitar, songwriter, television host, and actor Glenn Campbell died in Nashville, Tennessee at the age of 81. He was uh, he, he got hit pretty hard with the Alzheimer's. Uh, he was in a uh, he was actually in a long long-term uh, care facility uh, when he died. I say he was in bad shape when he died. Monday will be the 26th anniversary of Jerry Garcia's death. Died from a heart attack. 
at uh, Serenity Knowles Rehabilitation Clinic in San Francisco. He was aged 53. Thursday, I bet you guys didn't know this, Thursday will be 19 years since Lisa Marie Presley married actor Nicolas Cage at a resort in Hawaii. They're, they're not still married, though, are they? I don't know. Uh, no. Cage filed for divorce four months later. <laughs> It was, Why did I not It was a short term. It was a short term deal. <laughs> well, you know, Nicholas Cage. I, 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 I do like some of the roles he's been in. Uh, here's a fun fact. You know, he's the nephew of Francis Ford Coppola. Right. right. Mm-hmm. So, right. there you but, go. Boy, Nicholas, that nice... Nicholas, Nicholas Cage had uh, uh, his his first film appearance was as Nicholas Coppola, and he was he he had about uh, three seconds of screen time in uh, the Sean Penn movie uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. <laughs> he was uh, yeah he was washing dishes in a cafeteria. That was his first uh, first appearance. That's Nick- Boy, has he fallen from the A list? <laughs> He's had a pretty good career actually. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, on Tuesday will be the thirteenth year. 13th anniversary of uh, Isaac Hayes' death. He died at his home in Memphis at the age of 65. Uh, Police were called to his home after his wife found him unconscious. He was taken to a hospital where he was pronounced dead. Hayes won an Oscar for the 1971 hit theme from Shaft and was also known as the voice of Chef from the hit cartoon show South Park. He was married four times and had 12 children. He was also a, a Scientologist, right? And didn't he didn't he have a falling out? Didn't he quit uh, that role at South Park when he got mad when they made fun of Scientology in one of their episodes? I, I seem to remember that. Mm-hmm. Thursday will be the 53rd anniversary of the first time that Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, John Paul Jones, and John Bonham played together. And I, I, you're going to have a celebration that day, right? I so. will. I will. They that, that, that was. It was uh, Thursday. Will be the 53rd year anniversary of the first time they played together. They were rehearsing at a studio in Gerard Street in London's West End. Uh, they were planning on becoming the new version of the Yardbirds. In fact, they they went out and did a few shows as the Yardbirds before they decided that uh, they would change their name to Led Zeppelin. Uh, Friday is the 50th an- year anniversary of the last time that John Lennon set foot in Great Britain. 50 years ago, uh, this coming Friday, he got on uh, an, air- an airplane at Heathrow Airport, flew to New York, and he never set foot on British soil again after that. Uh, so, yeah, it was yeah, nine years. That was nine years before... Uh, before his death so yep he spent the last nine years of his life in new york never left new york saturday will be the 59th anniversary of pete best firing from the beatles uh the beatles weren't happy with the way he was performing so they decided to sack him and uh uh beatles manager brian epstein uh, got in a phone with a guy named Ringo Starr, who was nearing the end of a three-month gig with uh, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. And uh, Ringo said, yeah, I'll, I'll fill in. Yeah, just give me a chance to, uh, to finish up this gig, and I'll, I'll, come, I'll come play with John and George and Ringo and uh, uh, the other guy. And uh, he ended up becoming a permanent member of that band. Birthdays today, 79th birthday of John Gustafson, former bass player of Roxy Music, Ian Gillen Band, the Mersey Beats. Uh, he had a he, he was a longtime uh, session guitarist. Today is the 60th birthday of Irish guitarist and songwriter Dave Evans. You guys remember when you first heard Dave Evans, where you were? 
Which band was he with again? <laughs> He's otherwise known as the Edge from U2. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Now you're talking. All right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I thought their live at Red Rocks was a, a, yeah. a quite a. Yeah, today, 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 yeah, happy birthday to the Edge, 60 years old today. Also today, 48 years old, Scott Stapp, lead singer of the American rock band Creed who were pretty big in the mid-90s during the grunge era. Monday will be the 58th birthday of Whitney Houston, who, who passed in 2012. Tuesday, the 93rd birthday of Jimmy Dean, Big Band John and Sausages is what he is known for. <laughs> Also, Tuesday is the 74th birthday of Jethro Tull, frontman Ian Anderson. Also, Tuesday, born on the same day as Ian Anderson, was Ronnie Spector of the Ronettes. Both of them will be 74 years old on Tuesday. Wednesday, the aforementioned Joe Jackson will be 67 years old. Thursday will be the 72nd birthday of Mark Knopfler, Dire Straits. Also Thursday, the 71st birthday of Sparks lead singer Ronald Mayle. And last but not least, next Saturday, the 80th birthday of David Crosby. 80 years old. Landmark mm -hmm. birthday for David. Yeah. So, burning question. Yep. At age 74, can Ian Anderson still stand on one leg? <laughs> And play the flute at the same time, right? <laughs> Can he do his stork thing? You know, he said, yeah, I mean, that, that's such an iconic pose mm -hmm. from him. And, and he said that, I mean, that was never a pose for him. That was just, it, I mean, that was just organic. It was just, mm -hmm. he, that, that leg would start flying around when he was playing the flute, when he was concentrating. It's one of the, yeah, that's one of those things like Joe Cocker says, all of his, all of his antics. It was just, that was just natural. It, it, it just happened. Um, anyway, happy birthday to everybody who I just mentioned and several more who I didn't mention and, uh, yeah, happy anniversary to the, uh, to the Abbey road photo today. Well, speaking of organic, uh, stage things, uh, Pete Townsend, you know, is, is famous for his, uh, windmill guitar right. playing. And according to what I understand, um, he copied that from Keith Richards and he was backstage, uh, in the early days of the stones and he saw Keith Richards doing a windmill thing. And what Richards was doing was actually warming up and limbering up before the show. But Townsend thought it was a way that Richards was going to play. So he copied it thinking it was going to be a guitar style, but it wasn't, but, but he turned it into something very iconic for himself. Hmm. Okay. Anything else right. before we wrap this up? I'm good. Okay, we're going to try again uh, uh, next week. The three of us are going to take another shot at talking about uh, Yes is Fragile. Uh, but before that, join us on Wednesday when uh, Bob and, and uh, our occasional guest, Marissa, uh, are going to talk about a uh, uh, Dermot Kennedy concert that they saw last night. So, uh, yep, they're going to tell us about that on Wednesday. Uh, yeah, and check in Wednesday and see if uh, see if Bob might be wearing the same shirt then as he is now. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep telling Bob to change that shirt. He just yeah. doesn't want to do it. So we'll find, call out. We'll, we'll Bob. find, it, we'll find yeah. out Wednesday if he's changed his shirt or not. Right? <laughs> Yeah, think about these production values. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little end joke when when uh, when Bob and I started talking about doing uh, just doing two videos on Sunday and and holding one until the following Wednesday. <laughs> Bob said, "Well, should we change clothes?" <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I could I couldn't wait to get to a point where I could uh, where I could rank him on that. Yeah, it's just, 
So, it just so, lets so, you know, folks, the incredible production <laughs> values that are put into this. That's right. Mm -hmm. So come on, come on back. Check us out on Wednesday to hear about uh, the Dermot Kennedy show and uh, and to see if uh, see if Bob has done his laundry. <laughs> okay, okay, everybody. We'll see you Wednesday. Uh, we'll 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 be back next Sunday with a uh, with another edition of Gizrology Gazette. Have a good week, everybody. So long. Peace out. So long. <laughs>